bringing you faith, fun, and facts. Live from the studios of the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us on the show. Call 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. And good morning and welcome to GRN Live Friday edition. It is, boy, I'm in a good mood today. It is a beautiful, beautiful day where we are. I hope it is where you are as well. And uh, this is Journal Live. We do it twice a week. Uh, Joe and the team in Houston do it on Mondays, and then we uh, do it here uh, from the North Texas studio on Fridays. And today is April 24th, Friday of the second week of Easter. So happy Easter to you. Dave Palmer, uh, Dr. Chris Malloy from the University of Dallas is here with us uh, in studio, but social distancing still, almost, I think, exactly six feet away from me. So how are you doing, Dr. Malloy? Very well, thank you. Yeah, good to have you back. Uh, Cecil is even farther away from me, separated by glass. I have glass. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to be anywhere near us. And uh, Diane Xavier is uh, handling all of our social media, so you can check us out on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. And, uh, boy, it's a great day. Glad you're with us. Phone number 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. It's been close to two months now that... And I don't know when it all started. It was kind of gradual, although it did happen kind of quickly, that the whole world just got obsessed with uh, coronavirus and its implications. And, uh, you know, I kind of posed this question to uh, folks here in studio, and I ask you, dear listener, as well. Uh, uh, well, the backstory is I got a call yesterday from a priest, uh, a friend of mine, and uh, he was meeting with his bishop, and uh, the bishop was interested about you know, should we kind of get things rolling again? Should we need to phase back public masses? And Cecil actually has a story about some dioceses that are, have made that decision this morning. And uh, the priest said, you know, what are you hearing? You know, what's, uh, are you ready? And what are people saying? And I, I told him, and I'll ask you guys as well. I told him on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm a 10. I'm ready. I mean, if they had masses this weekend, I'm there. I mean, if somebody was sitting a foot from me, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm ready to get back. Absolutely. I don't know. I don't know. How, how are you feeling? No, you, same I, exact I, way. You, you're ready Confession, to go. Confession, mass, I want to go. Yeah, yeah. I emailed our pastor. Whether it's this. 50 people, you know, and spaces, fine. Yeah. Cecil, how about you? Oh, same, 100%. I am ready. Like what Dr. Boy said, adoration. Like it's you don't realize how much you miss just when you're having a rough day running to adoration yeah. or going to confession more often right. until you can't have it. Yeah, I'm ready. And I bet most people listening right now, uh, you can call and let us know. Maybe tell Cecil what's on your mind. Uh, we may be able to get you on the line. Got a pretty uh, busy show today. And so we've got uh, a lot of topics to talk about. And uh, are you ready to get back into the swing of things? I think most of us are. Cecil has a story. We just found out uh, Joe Schuler from our D.C. office uh, sent an email to us saying that I'm just teasing it. I'm not going to get, get you know steal your thunder <laughs> here, Cecil. So, so, but four new dioceses uh, have now said, "Hey, let's get things uh, open up again." And uh, I decided this morning we're going to have a balance. You know, rather than talk about coronavirus the whole hour and all coronavirus all the time, we're going to spend the first half talking about something really absolutely unrelated. And this is something that uh, Dr. Malloy, I know you're pretty excited about because you like this topic. Uh, it's uh, Russell Shaw has written a book called, um, uh, let's see, what is, uh, what is the name of his book? Eight, Eight Popes, Popes and the Crisis of Modernity. That's pretty cool. So the crisis of modernity. What is modernity and what eight popes from Pius X to uh, John Paul II? He stopped at John Paul II. That's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know. 20th century. Okay, so he's just taken one century. All right. So you've had a chance to read some of the book? I have. I read yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, all right. So that's the half that really has nothing directly to do with coronavirus. And then the second half, I'm excited about this. I got a book in the mail a, a couple of weeks ago. It's called The Knights of Columbus, an Illustrated History. A Story of Faith, Leadership, and Service. It's written by Andrew Walther and uh, Maureen Walther. I'm guessing man and wife. I'm just, I'm just going to guess. Man and his mother? I, I doubt it. But man and wife, uh, it doesn't say in the book. But uh, anyways, uh, uh, Andrew Walther is very, very involved in the Knights of Columbus, and he's going to join us. Not only to talk about the book, which I think is really cool, very, a lot of illustrations and talks about the Knights throughout history, but also what are the Knights of Columbus doing during the uh, pandemic to help people out? And uh, I'll just give you a little hint. They're, they're doing a lot. You know, it's all mostly behind the scenes. Uh, but the Knights are, are doing a lot. So that'll be in the second half uh, of the program. And uh, Cecil has some other stories uh, in the news to tell us about. But before that, I just want to mention a couple of things real quickly. Joe has mentioned about the, the unveiling of the new website. 
I've had a chance to look at the website that Joe will be uh, unleashing in, on the public here in about a week or so, and it is really nice. And you're going to be in store for So if you want to see the old <laughs> website, you got about a week to cherish to, it yeah, now. Cherish it. I don't even know if cherish is the, the <laughs> right, word, right. but uh, go check it Think out. Screenshots. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're sentimental about the old website, go see it right now, okay? GRNonline.com because it's about to change and change uh, for the better. The only other thing uh, I'm going to say before throwing over to Sissel uh, with the news is, you know, nowadays, it's all virtual conferences. Everybody's doing all these virtual conferences. There's all kinds of them. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we are actually going to be hosting a virtual conference uh, here in North Texas. There's a group called the, the Catholic Brothers for Christ. And they had a conference scheduled for tomorrow here in North Texas. And, of course, they're not going to do it. But it's going to be on the radio here in North Texas. And it's going to be on all of our social media platforms across the network. Uh, Deacon Harold Brooks Sivers is going to be the guest. And he's going to give a talk on the Eucharist, and he's also going to lead the rosary for, and obviously, you don't have to be a man to, to tune in. Men, women, you know, children, anybody that wants to. Tomorrow morning, beginning at 9 o'clock Central on all of our social media platforms, and if you're in North Texas, on the radio. So that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so, um, all right. So that's what's going on here uh, at the, the, the network, uh, 877-757-9424. Russell Shaw would join us in just a few minutes. And Sissel is uh, keeping an, an eagle <laughs> eye on some of the news stories. What's going on? Well, like you mentioned, Dave, we just found out that three more di Catholic dioceses have announced that they will resume public celebration of Mass this weekend. Um, and Was it last week that we talked about Las Cruces was yeah. the first one uh -huh. in New Mexico? So now we have Helena and uh, Great Falls Billings in Montana and Lubbock, Texas mm -hmm. are also resuming. Now, of course, they are saying that they're still going to have to keep some pretty strict guidelines and that uh, at least in Helena, the bishop is saying that it— it is still uh you're still able to not go to mass if you don't think it's best for you right now you're still dis dispensated from, dis from yeah. having a dispensation for not going to mass but it's kind of exciting because dave said last week put out the call you know i wonder if anyone else is gonna follow in those yeah, yeah. these are all kind of sparsely populated yes. areas yeah right? definitely not, you know not new york yeah City yeah or, <laughs> i think okay. it's gonna be a while for that to happen yeah um, so one of the first things when uh, COVID-19 started becoming a thing that happened was that schools shut down and most colleges through the end of the semester pretty early on decided that they weren't going to be coming back in person. Several co um, colleges are not coming back for the summer and there's even talk about if they're going to come back for the fall. Now, of course, in all of this, a lot of people are in slightly pretty financially tight situations. And so to counter that, one of the Catholic universities in Steubenville, Ohio, um, the University of um, of Steubenville has decided that all incoming freshmen for the first semester fall 2020 and all transfer students are going to have no tuition, which is interesting and it's been making quite a bit of the headlines. So I was that's good, roughly like fifteen thousand dollars of um, that they're waiving because that's for semester. Um, so definitely interesting. I don't know, Dave and Dr. Moy, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts being a professor at uh, University of Dallas. Uh, not not a competing school per se, but a but it's an, in another the Catholic, Catholic world. Yeah. Well, we're, yeah. yeah, we're in the uh, we're in the same pool. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah no, uh, myself and colleagues, you know, th uh, some some colleagues, and I'm not speaking for the university, of course, but yeah. just for myself, uh, we're a little we're a little concerned about it. You know, I understand the good intention, but it does have effects on other colleges. Yeah. You know, how can you keep your 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 tuitions the same? I guess the question I have is, did they consult their peer institutions? Mm, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah, that, that's... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I could see how... Yeah, it's, it's kind of like... Uh even though we're all in the same game, we're all about education, uh, there, there is a certain aspect. Everybody's looking for students to come to their university. There's a certain competitive aspect. And oh, there so, definitely is. Yeah. No, sure. And, and I mean, numbers are lower. Yeah. Numbers are lower all across the board, mm. whether it's Harvard, Notre Dame, applications. Yeah. Interesting. And I thought, you know, a, a, an education at Steubenville is about $30,000. Yeah. Yes. And I was thinking about, what about the, the current students? Right. You know, what about right. them? I mean, they're like, what am I, chop liver? Right. Oh, no, everyone coming back in the fall, I think. I thought am, it was, am I wrong? I'm pretty sure it was just what? freshmen and transfer oh. students oh, and, like, beginning no. first semester there. They said of. they're starting up a fund yes, they are to starting help fund. out the returning students. Because okay. I'm thinking, like, gosh, just because I started last year, I, I got, <laughs> not going to give That's a little rough. That's a little rough. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Benedictine and uh, the Catholic University of America have... Have, uh, spoken out and said that they are extending their application deadlines and doing other things, but they are not uh, going uh, as far as Steubenville is going. They're the ones that I've spoken out so far. Um, and then 
Uh, kind of exciting news. Uh, Archbishop Jose Gomez of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and president of the U.S. Bishops Conference uh, is inviting all U.S. bishops to join him on May 1st in reconsecrating the U.S. the Blessed Virgin Mary in response to the pandemic. And uh, it is actually timed at the same time that Canada's bishops are also going to be consecrating their country to May. And even a petition was going out in Italy. And so now the Italy bishops are also going to oh, be doing it. Wow. So it's kind of becoming a worldwide uh, thing. All right. So Dr. Malloy, what, what does this mean exactly? We hear about consecration uh, of Russia in Fatima. It, it sounds like it's already been done. We've already consecrated the country, but we're re-consecrating. And so our country. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Well, you can so, always do it please again. Please explain. You know, the, the bishops of Portugal, I believe, uh, consecrated uh, Portugal mm -hmm. um, soon after Pope Francis became pope, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, so can, you can do it again and again. Um, it's what's interesting is you think it's just a paper act, yeah, but it's actually an act of the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, how easy could it be? Just get up there and do it. Right. Well, but you got the weight of the church behind you. You're like steering a boat. It's yeah. a big thing. Yeah. Uh, as far as graces being poured down, I'm looking at it from like you know the the the, the big picture. I mean, what what does it mean from a practical standpoint? I mean, uh, oh, it, it's it's more of a, a reminder that hey, listen, we are under the mantle of Our Lady, and is it for the sake of the people or is something actually? I, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase that. What what what's well, what, I mean, what, it's what, not what, a what's, sacrament. What's but the I mean, effect of it? I think graces happen. Let's yeah. look at the consecration of Russia. See, in my opinion, it, it has not happened. Yeah. The consecration of Russia, of the world, yes, et cetera, but of Russia by the Pope in union with the bishops. I don't believe that's happened. Yeah. But um, the graces happen. So John Paul II consecrated um, the world, right, in, in 84, I believe. Yeah. Look what happened it, in 89. Yeah. And so real graces happen, and I and I think even uh, when Pius the Twelfth he consecrated Russia, but just by himself. Yeah, I always find it odd, and of course this is probably a, a topic for another day, but uh, that we don't know. It, you know there's debate about whether Russia was consecrated. It's kind of like, come on, it's it pretty either, serious it either debate. Was yeah. or it wasn't. I mean, uh, and, and I think that's kind of odd. It's pretty our, clear our that lady it wasn't. Asked pretty clearly for that to happen. <laughs> uh, when All I was right. looking up this story, I just wanted to say real quick that I found a great definition by Blessed Is She for what a Marian consecration is. Just in case anyone's oh, okay. listening, I just okay. thought uh, Marian consecration is the act of entrusting one's body, soul, possessions, works, and entire life to the protection, guidance, and intercession of Our Lady. All right, there so you go. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to uh, Archbishop Gomez for uh, starting this, and it sounds like it's spreading across the... the so is that it? I know we got to take a break. And yeah, definitely, back. but I would just... Real quick, if you want to look up, there's a saint. If you're unemployed, there is a saint, uh, Saint Catagen, who is very interesting, very cool guy, but... Um, <laughs> So, well, I know we're running out of time. I, I could go into his life story. Catagen. Catagen. He was a contemporary with Martin Luther. He wanted to reform the church as well, but he did it from the inside. He was a priest, and he was part of an order um, called the Congregation of Clerics Regular, who were uh, lived in a lot of poverty, and he started a hospital for the people who did uh, were not likely to recover. So he did a lot of really cool stuff, and he's someone that you can ask for intercession for All if right. you are struggling financially at this I'm time. I'm just laughing because you said he's a really cool guy. <laughs> I picture him like in you know, a black leather jacket, you know, like Fonzie or something. That was Cecil panicking, like, <laughs> I don't have much time. What can I say? <laughs> he's a really cool guy. <laughs> not uh, the best, but yeah. yeah. No, no, that's no. all right. No, that's good to know. So for St. Cajetan, uh, pray for all those who are unemployed, um, Definitely. Uh, underemployed, Absolutely. which I know that it's millions yes. of people. Probably yes. a lot of people yes, listening right yeah. now. And isn't St. Corona for um, yes, pan uh, sick people? Yeah. Sick people, yeah. Pan pandemic? I think it's actually for pandemics, yeah. That's, that's wild. Crazy. Oh, that's very wild. All right, so that's what's going on. Thanks, Cecil. And uh, we're going to get Russell Shaw on the line and talk about uh, the crisis of modernity. And he's written a great book, uh, eight, eight Popes and the Crisis of Modernity. So this is Joanne Alive. If you have any questions, you want to join us, 877-757-9424. We'll be right back. Solidarity HealthShare is rebuilding Catholic health care in America. We conform to the moral guidelines of the Catholic Church so you never have to worry about your health care dollars paying for anything that violates your conscience. From conception to natural death, we strive to serve all health care needs, protect human life, celebrate families, and promote the dignity of all people. Join Solidarity HealthShare in restoring and rebuilding authentic Catholic health care by signing up at SolidarityHealthShare.org, a sponsor of the Guadalupe Radio Network. Hello, Guadalupe family. This is Toya Hall, Vice President of the Guadalupe Radio Network. With deep appreciation for your support, you and your loved ones will be remembered in our Novena of Masses this Easter. We know these are difficult times, but we can trust in our Heavenly Father that He will see us through. Have hope and joy, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And may all the blessings of the risen Christ be yours this Easter and throughout the year. 
All right, we are back, and this is GRN Live here on uh, Friday morning, April 24th. Glad you're with us. Phone number is 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. Russell Shaw, widely published author and journalist. Uh, he has written over 80 books, uh, not 80, 20, <laughs> over 20 books, including the one that we're speaking about today, Eight Popes in the Crisis of Modernity, and for 18 years, uh, he directed media relations for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the United States Catholic Conference. And from 87 to 97, he oversaw media relations f uh, for the Knights of Columbus, which is interesting because that'll be the topic of our next uh, guest here in a little while. So, Russell Shaw, welcome to Join Live. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning. Yes, it's good to be with you. And uh I might say it really does feel like 80 books. <laughs> I was making you a much more prolific author than you were. I was thinking of the eight popes, and eight, 20 became 80. So. Well, you're probably on the 21st by now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr. Chris Malloy from the University of Dallas is here uh, Good morning. with me. I always tell guests, if you, if you feel like you're hearing multiple voices, you're not going crazy, okay? I promise. Okay. Uh, so, all right, I guess we're going to start off uh, ab about the book. Well, what, what is modernism? How do you define it? Well, modernism in theological terms was uh, a, 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 a word, a term coined by uh, Pope St. Pius X uh, more than a century ago, and he was describing, using that word, modernism, to uh, characterize a kind of loose gaggle of ideas entertained and promulgated by a, a loosely knit group of uh, Catholic intellectuals and academics of, of that period. Uh, basically, again, as a theological concept, modernism had at its heart, its, its center, a kind of psychologizing or subjectivizing of, uh, of religion itself. You know, we believe as, uh, as Christians that our faith is grounded on uh, uh, the fact of uh, divine revelation as communicated and embodied, especially in Jesus Christ. But for the modernists, uh, religion was an expression of human need. It was something that, as it were, we spin out of our own insides and uh, shape to our own liking in order to satisfy our own anxieties and, and aspirations. That was roundly condemned, that way of thinking, that psychologizing of, uh, of religion by uh, St. Pius X. But, you know, the idea, that way of thinking is still with us today. I mean, it's not, not dominant among good, faithful people, but there are those who still more or less tend to think along those lines. What, what do you think are some examples of that? Some examples of that? Well, you find people who will make their moral judgments on, the, you know, not on the basis of... Uh, of natural law or uh, clear and firm church teaching, but on the basis of the way they feel. I feel like that's the right thing to do, and you know, that, that's the be-all and end-all of, of their, uh, their moral reasoning, their, their feelings, their intuitions. And uh, feelings play a part in morality, heaven knows, but uh, trying to guide and organize the whole of your moral life on the basis of your feelings is a highly risky proposition. I, I know, uh, uh, Russell Shaw, you, you talk about the roots of modernism, and I wanted to ask you what my, some of the causes are. Uh, I know, going back even to the 19th century, I, I'm not nearly as well-read as the two of you are, but one of my favorite encyclicals is Eternity Patris by Leo the Thirteenth, and I know that goes uh, a, a bit further back, but uh, he talks about philosophers. He talks about philosophers kind of... Uh, uh, errant philosophers. Well, what do you think is uh, the cause, especially of the last hundred years of, of the crisis of, mo of modernism? Well, you know, there's a, there's a famous book uh, by an author named Richard Weaver, and the book is called Ideas Have Consequences. Indeed, they do. We may tend to think of philosophers as kind of I ivory tower people whose, uh, whose deliberations may be of, be of interest to them and possibly to people in a graduate's school seminar, but have no real bearing on practicalities in the world we live in. But time and again, over and over and again, the ideas of philosophers or people posing as philosophers have had direct past, uh, practical consequences on human life and, and the way we organize our, our societies. Uh, I, 
a painful but conspicuous example of that, Karl Marx. Marx was uh, was was a, a a thinker, a philosopher. He was not a man of action, really. He thought and thought and wrote and wrote, but for better or worse, and I would say mo- mostly for worse, Karl Marx has proved to be have a powerful practical impact on the 20th and now the 21st century. Yeah, the, the book is called Eight Popes in the Crisis of Modernity. It goes from Pius X to John Paul II, and uh, some people may say, well, gosh, why did you end it, uh, John Paul II? You're probably just picking a, a century. Uh, would, that, would that imply that the, uh, as you call in the book, the crusade against modernism, has it been going on under the most two recent popes, or has there been a, a, a letdown in this battle against modernism? Well, that's a uh, that's really a pretty complex question. I'm, I'm afraid it's going to get a complex answer, but the fact is that uh, I believe, and I'm not alone in this. Heaven knows that uh, the modern era, as such, ended during the the 20th century. Uh, there's the title of a very fine book by Romano Guardini, a prominent Catholic theologian of the last century. The book is called "The End of the Modern World." And uh, Guardini published the book in the late 1940s, but uh, he, he, he argued then that, in fact, the, the modern world, the modern era, had come to an end to, as a result of, largely as a result of, and during and immediately after the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, many people, in fact, now taking their lead from Guardini and other thinkers like him, uh, speak of this age in which we're living now, not as the modern age, but as the postmodern age, and that tells you something. I think about the way the way times have indeed changed and changed fundamentally in that route. You know, modernity didn't end on any one particular date. I can't say you know it ended last Tuesday of last week or something like that. There was a complex process. Uh, continuing over a period of many years of, during the 20th century. But I repeat, Romano Guardini believed, and I believe, and a lot of other people believe, that what we think of as the modern age ended during the 20th century. And, and when now you... we're in the postmodern era. Hmm. And uh, I would say that uh, as a result of that, um, the two popes of this century to date, Pope Benedict XVI and uh, Pope Francis are popes of the postmodern era, not of the modern era. And uh, while their 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 pontificates are of <laughs> extreme interest to 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 all of us, uh, they just fall outside the parameters of the kind of book I kind of book I was trying to write. Also, there is a fundamental theme to my book, and I think it's a valid theme in relation to the process of. Uh, of change and and the end of modernity, the process that I'm trying to describe, and that is the human person at the the heart of the crisis of modernity, which I write about in my book and which all of the popes about whom I wrote write were hoping. At the heart of it was this idea of the human person. What is a human person? Where do we come from? Where are we headed? How are we, how ought we to deal with one another? These are the questions of personalism, which, at the, at the end of end of the line of, of modern, the, the popes of the 20th century, uh, Pope Saint John Paul II dealt with extensively and extremely profoundly in his writings, both before and after he became pope. In your book, you say uh, you describe po- postmodernism, um, and, and I agree with you. As as uh, maybe not a placeholder, but at at a time between times. Uh, hey, yeah, do you, we're going to have to find a better name for it eventually. Yeah, eventually. No so, sense just trying to sit back now and say I'm going to call it this or that or the other thing. For the moment, what postmodern do you, you know <laughs> describes it you know adequately, but not finally. Eventually, <laughs> a long time from now, other people will come up with a better name for it. Yeah, and uh, what do you see as the the lines of a possible future emergence? If if postmodernity is is a, a little bit lacking in identity, a transition period, what do you see as um, 
I mean, obviously we can't see the future, but you're a historian. What do you see as lines of uh, emerge possible emergence, different maybe two directions that could, could emerge down the road? Well, you know, uh, Romano Guardini, who I, I keep referring to, kind of anticipated this question. And in the book of his that I mentioned, he, he gives you a, a, a kind of an answer. Uh, Guardini points out, and many people would say this is pretty obvious, that uh, we've achieved in modern times, we've achieved enormous progress in science and technology. And as a result, we've uh, attained a, a far greater control over uh, the physical world around us. Uh, and you know, this, this enhances our, our power immensely. But as Gordini points out, our power to control ourselves and make good use of this newly power, newly acquired power of ours over nature, that's still in doubt. <laughs> we're 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 the ones who are a big question mark. What will we do with our power? And you know, goodness knows, we're still dealing with that question big time in uh, in our world today. I mean, a world which faces enormous questions of war and peace, of uh, questions pertaining to uh, faith and persecution, and questions of, uh, of, of displaced populations, population extinction, either by violent means or by artificial means, on and on and on, you know, a, a, a huge number of large unanswered, unanswered questions relating to how we as, as human beings are going to use the power which we've acquired over natural processes. Um, and that's the challenge of, of, now of the present day, and it's also the challenge of the future, I think. To, you know, what are we going to do about the, hum the human question mark in regard to uh, the use of power? Another question. Uh, oh, Dave, you had a question. Oh, no, I was just going to get out the phone number. If anybody wants to join us, 877-757-9424, uh, 877-757-9424. Eight Popes in the Crisis of Modernity. Russell Shaw is the author and our guest here on Jury on Alive. Another question would be, uh, would be this. It, it, you know, it's a simplistic statement, um, but there's, there's a grain of truth to it, um, and, and uh, your book alludes in that direction. Um, and it's this, that is, if you say from Pius X through Pius XII, that there's a certain kind of, um, you could say soberness or some you know, uh, somberness. Um, there's, there's an anticipation of um, the direction of the world is going in a bad direction. Now, they're not without hope, obviously. And so they right. do have hope, and there's signs of hope. Conversely, from John the Twenty Third through John Paul II, there is a there. There seems to be a, a at least with those two, there seems to be a, a a fairly deep hope, hopefulness, looking forward. At the same time, um, at least John Paul II, um, in the last few years, I I, I, I think someone has um, indicated that somewhere in the late '90s he had kind of a premonition of Europe kind of being engulfed in. Um, you know, in problems, very bad problems, even in flames. Do you have a? Do you think that the early popes were completely off base? Do you think even that this later premonition of John Paul II, Paul VI, we could add the smoke of Satan, which you mentioned, that that uh, not just in the church but in the world, that we're really headed for difficult times. Do you think that they were off base? What do you think uh, about that premonition? No, I think they were. Uh... They were, you know, far-sighted and foresighted, and that they could see the way in which things were headed. You know, people ask me sometimes which which of these popes I found the most interesting, and that's a. Uh, there were eight of them in in my book, and uh, it's a hard choice. They're all interesting. I, they, their pontificates were all of great importance and and make make fascinating reading. But if I had to pick one among the eight, it would be uh, the one who, in studying whom I. I learned the most, and that was Pope Pius XI. Mm. Now, Pius XI was uh, Pope from uh, 1922 to 1939, 17 years. So he had a pretty long pontificate, but it wasn't just long. It was uh, a pontificate which took place 
against a background of enormous uh, world problems and crises of all sorts. Uh, as for example, uh, you you had uh, well the the rise of fascism, Nazism, and Soviet communism during that, those years. You had uh, the Great Depression, the violent persecution of the church in uh, so-called Catholic countries like Mexico and Spain, um, and and uh, the drift towards World War II, which which was very very obvious by by the mid middle years of, of the 1930s. And then finally, I would say you, you had the, the first stirrings of the revolution in moral values, which uh, came to a head in, uh, in the 1960s and 1970s with, at the, at the most positive, I would say, extremely mixed results. Um, and all, all of these things, all of these issues uh, were issues which this pope, Pius XI, had to deal with. Now, he didn't solve these problems. For heaven's sake, who, who could you say solved problems like these? But he recognized them, and he addressed them, and he tried to relate the teaching of the doctrine of the church to, to all of these things, and he did a darn good job of it. And in the, that process, I think he not, he not only kept the Catholic Church of his day on an even keel, but he provided us with, with a lot of insights and, and uh, directions to, to help us uh, as we proceed to deal with these problems and other problems and, and their consequences uh, in our times. Uh, uh, Mr. Shaw, let me ask you a question uh, uh, in relation to Vatican II, because a lot of people, I think, you know, Vatican II, of course, was a pretty controversial council, and some people would say that uh, it represented the Church in some ways cozying up a little bit too much to the culture, uh, whereas opposed before that, some people had said there's more of a bunker mentality, it's us against them. Uh, how, how, how does Vatican II and also the, the two popes that presided over it play into this whole uh, crisis of modernity? Well, I think the Council sometimes gets a bad rap, more or less, along the lines that you outlined there. Uh, that that negative take on Vatican II is justified and accurate up to a point. Yeah, there is a uh, an element of excessive optimism and, and a too benevolent ver view of modernity in some some of the documents of Vatican II, especially perhaps the uh, pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. But there there is also, I think, a uh, blessed realism in Va in Vatican II, which tempers the the optimism and and adds up on balance to a pretty a pretty uh, pretty savvy and pretty accurate view of 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 reality and and the church's relation to the modern world. Even the uh, constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, is a uh, a very interesting document to read. It's very long. It has its high points and its long low points. Uh, it's, it's kind of wordy in, in places, but on balance, it, it re represents the church attempting to address and doing a pretty good job at addressing uh, the problems and issues of, of the uh, of the world of that day and, and to some extent of our day also. So I don't I don't think Vatican II was all one thing or all the other, and I would say on on balance it did a pretty good job, and we can be be glad that it did. You, you, intri um, you intriguingly the, uh, in the book. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you intriguingly mm -hmm. in the book set out that conversation um, that you know so and so said, uh, look at everything that's happened, um, and in fact the, the the statistics of which you're aware are are rather remarkable if you track. Um, vocations, especially, let's say, seminarians, religious nuns, priests, uh, etc., uh, that they, they grow, 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 grow in the U.S., I'm thinking, okay, in the U.S. until 65, and then they um, fall off the edge of the cliff. Uh, now, you see, you in that uh, conversation, you say someone said, you know, look, look at the obvious uh, fruits, and of course, we can't just say history is the sole fruits of the only cause, which is the council. It's, you know, a logical fallacy. But um, could you compare, is there any comparable council in the church's history 
with a kind of precipitous fall off in a things uh, at the heart of the church? Well, I don't think so, but you know, the point has been made often and accurately, I believe, that uh, uh, it takes a good hundred years or so for, to, for the church to settle down after any, any uh, ecumenical council, and I'm sure that was true of Vatican II also. As so far we got to wait the 50, fall 55 off after more. Vatican II, well, I think it's fair to ask what would have happened if there hadn't been a Vatican II. Sure. What, you know, could the church have, have continued as it was uh, at the end of the pontificate of Pius XII and, and uh, survived? I doubt it, frankly. I suspect that things might, might, in fact, have been much worse for the church in terms of at least new ter- numerical measures uh if there had been no Second Vatican Council with its program of uh, reform and renewal. And so, it, again, uh, you can argue this both, way and, uh, both ways, and there's a lot of speculation in any argument, but I, my, my view of it generally is that Vatican II did a pretty good job with certain faults, and, and, um, and we can be grateful in light of subsequent events that, uh, that things aren't worse than, than, than they are. Also, I would say this, that uh, the the problems which arose after Vatican II weren't the fruit of the council precisely. Rather, they were the fruit of wild-eyed misinterpretations of the council on the part of uh, uh, so-called advocates of the spirit of Vatican II. And that's what caused all the trouble, not the council itself. Yeah, and I, I liked your pointing out the... Uh... You snuck Pope Benedict in there um, by, as, as as sort of the the one with the with that uh, with that two thousand five uh, address to the Curia. Could you could you speak to this whole hermeneutic of a reform versus the hermeneutic of rupture? As to like in the last fifteen years, what's what do you think is dominating uh, culturally and ecclesiastically? Uh, what what kind which hermeneutic? I mean, you can maybe define okay. those. We got about three minutes, by the way. That's a loaded question, but uh, you got okay, a well, few that, minutes that, to answer here. That analysis, hermeneutic of uh, rupture, hermeneutic of continuity, that that comes, of course, from Pope Benedict XVI, who, as Father Joseph Ratzinger, was one of the um, leading theologians of Vatican II. He's a man of Vatican II, and he he's still still span, stands with the Council and sees some faults and failings, but by and large, he's, he's, he's very much a Vatican II pope. Um, now, which hermeneutic has prevailed in recent times? I think, by and large, the, the, the popes and the, the hierarchy and the loyal theologians in the church have attempted to uh, use and, and apply the hermeneutic of continuity, namely, you know, understand and interpret and carry out Vatican II in the context of the Church's great tradition. But that other hermeneutic, the hermeneutic of rupture and and radical change, that's still out there, too. So the the competition between the two goes on, and I don't see any immediate end in sight. Yeah, very good. Uh, Russell Shaw, the book is called Eight Popes in the Crisis of Modernity, his 20th book, not his 80th. Uh, <laughs> uh, we appreciate your time with us uh, this morning. Uh, I guess people can get it at the normal places. Of course, most Catholic bookstores are, are closed these days, but uh, uh, get it online or uh, wherever good Catholic books are sold, right? Any uh, other suggestions for websites where they can learn more about you and your, and your books? Well, you can just go to the Ignatius Press website oh, and great. Uh, buy it there, as well as at the usual booksellers' websites. Which I think is Ignatius.com, if I, if I remember right. right. Uh, okay, Russell, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Great speaking with you. Appreciate your, your time on the show today. I was just going to mention, because I know you got to run, uh, Dr. Malloy, but uh, I, I, I didn't want to reiterate a question that I kind of already asked him, but I, I think the language has kind of changed in modern area. We don't really talk about people being heretics anymore. We don't uh, excommunication. It isn't talked about as much. Uh, the uh, the was it Canon nine fifteen? Is it uh, about uh, you know politicians not receiving the Eucharist? It seems like in some ways. And I asked him. I didn't want to you know keep badgering him with the same question. We've softened a bit. The, the the battle against modernity today is not what it used to be. Would you agree? Well, the like, the pastoral strategy has certainly changed. Yeah. yeah. So the medicine. John John um, the twenty third said you know medicine of mercy. 
And that's basically what you see now. Uh, that's, the, that's the mantra. And there's a question. There's, there's a theologian named Ralph Martin, and he just asks the question, have we, has our strategy gone too far the other way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people would say yes. Yeah. You know, and again, we don't want you know be you know burning people at the stake or you know going too far the other direction. But it seems like it's been a, I don't know the guidance is, is good. modernity being battled today. I mean, in the modern church, I don't know is modernism. Is, yeah, mean, is, yeah, yeah, yeah is, modern, is modernism being uh, battled like Pius X? Uh, well, if he came back today, would he say, "Wow, you guys are really carrying this this struggle on. Good job," or would he say, "Wait, what happened? What happened to what I started here?" It's great to have a holistic view and yes. put things in a beautiful light. It's also good to be clear. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we, we had clarity, and we've kind of lost that in the last 60 years. I think so. All right. We'll have to leave it God at that. God bless. Yeah, good seeing you. Great to uh, see you. Dr. Malloy is going to take off. We're going to come back and talk about the Knights of Columbus, two things we're going to focus on. There's a great book. I really, I've really, i got it here in my hand. If you're watching us on social media, uh, you can see it. The Knights of Columbus, an illustrated history, a story of faith, leadership, and service. Uh, Andrew Walther is uh, one of the authors, along with, uh, I presume, his wife, Maureen Walther, and uh, also talk about what the Knights of Columbus are doing during the COVID-19 crisis to help people, millions of people, with monetary help and uh, physical help. And so we'll talk all about that after this quick break here on GRN Alive. Thanks for joining us. There has never been and will never come a day when our loving Jesus Christ is not a part and soul of our life. He will never ever forget us. He has carved each of our names on the palm of his hands. So let us all together thank and praise our risen Lord for his abundant and unconditional blessings. This is Diane Xavier, a member of the production team at KATH 910 AM. Wishing you and your families a blessed and wonderful Easter. I'll bet you know by now that Amazon Smile is a great way to support your favorite charity. And supporting the Guadalupe Radio Network while you shop is easy. Step one, just start off at smile.amazon.com. Step two, choose La Promesa Foundation as your charity. La Promesa Foundation is the parent company of Guadalupe Radio Network. And step three, enjoy your shopping. Amazon will donate a portion of your purchase to the La Promesa Foundation, and it doesn't cost you any extra. La Promesa Foundation and Guadalupe Radio Network, thank you. This is Lynn Oswald, president of the Guadalupe Radio Network, with this week's GRN Family Minute. We hope you and your family had a very blessed Easter week. This is another special week in our Holy Catholic Church. It is Divine Mercy Week. St. John Paul II described divine mercy as the answer to the world's problems and the central message of the third millennium. The theme of divine mercy was undoubtedly one of the greatest spiritual legacies of his life and pontificate. He saw the great need for souls, yours and mine, to come to know the immensity and greatness of God's mercy. Repeatedly, he wrote and spoke about the need for us to turn to the mercy of God as the answer to the specific problems of our times. Please know that each workday, the GRN staff comes together via conference call at 3 p.m., the hour of divine mercy, to pray the chaplet for your needs and prayer intentions. May God bless you and your families. All right, this is Jarn Live. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we just got some interesting news. Uh, we <laughs> called our guest, and <laughs> and I guess he had been double booked. Accidentally double booked, and so he's unable to come on the show this morning. But oh, don't worry, it's a gosh. pandemic, and we're very adaptable. <laughs> That's right. We got to adapt. Okay, well, we were going to talk, and uh, Dr. Malloy has left the building. He, had, he got back to the University of... Uh, Dallas, so this is a time, dear listener, where we are going to count on you, because what we were going to talk about uh, with Andrew Walther uh, and uh, his, he and his wife, uh, Maureen Walther, have written a book called The Knights of Columbus, an illustrated history, a story of faith, leadership, and service. And uh, the, the, the book was one of the topics, and we're also going to talk about what the Knights of Columbus are doing uh, to help people during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And so this is where we are going to say, you know what, we've got about 12 minutes of Broadcast airtime, and we want to hear from you. And what are you doing, or what has, uh, what has happened in your diocese, your archdiocese, your parish, uh, to to kind of get people through this crisis? And also, the question that I posed at the beginning of the program was: on a scale of one to ten, how ready are you uh, to get back to the public participation of mass? I said that I'm a ten. I think uh, Dr. Malloy said ten. Sissel said ten. 
And I bet that not everybody's a 10. You might say, well, I don't know. I've got an underlying health condition. I'm not quite ready to get back and, you know, shake people's hands at the sign of peace. What? How, how do you feel about that? 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. This is an opportunity to let your voice be heard. Okay, let's hear from you. How... Uh, uh, it, there, were, there were, what, four dioceses? It started yeah. with Las Cruces, yeah, New Las Mexico, Cruces, right? Now two in Montana and one here in Texas. Yeah, uh, so. yeah. I wonder what the, the, the first, you know, big diocese is going right. to be yeah. to do it. I'm, I'm going to say nothing in California, nothing in New York. Um, yeah, yeah. But, and then it was Washington State that got hit pretty hard. Louisiana, yes, especially Louisiana, down in New, in New Orleans. New Jersey, I've heard, was pretty bad, too. Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so you're mm -hmm. saying uh, if they said open up the masses this weekend and— you know, just regular like it was three months yeah, ago, you're, I would you're go. there, right? I would go, yeah. I mean, like I said, I think I said last week on the after show, I wouldn't immediately jump back into getting together with all my friends, especially anyone who is older and stuff like that. And might be, you know, if I was going to public masses, I may not just start socializing with just anyone. So I'd still have some caution. But, yeah, going to mass would not be a problem for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, what do you all think? Uh, would you be the same or would you be a little bit more guarded than <laughs> what we are? <laughs> I actually had a, a Zoom call with my, my family last night, and I asked them the question. I think most people are, are ready to go. And the other issue is, you know, some of the things going on in the culture. You know, the, the governor of Michigan has taken a lot of uh, criticism because uh, she's, you know, really, really restricting people's ability even to buy you know, gardening supplies, whereas, you know, the abortion clinics are still open. Right. You can still go get liquor. Right. I wonder what people are thinking as far as would you like to see the civil restrictions relaxed? Would you like to be able to... Uh, do you, do you, do you want to wear the face mask? Do you want to have to wear the face mask? What do you think? 877-757-9424. Uh, 877-757-9424. Would you like your bishop or archbishop to say, all right, we're going to go ahead and open things up, uh, especially since we are broadcasting to a lot of very heavily populated areas. We're you know, broadcasting into the Archdiocese of D.C., and uh, Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, a lot of people there. And so, uh, let us know what you, what you think. Uh, the consensus here at the uh, studio is let's open things up. But I think at the same time, and I think we'd all uh, agree, this has got to be a decision that's made by the bishops, and uh, we want to be obedient uh, to the the decisions they make because it's not an easy one. Uh, for sure. We also have to pr pray for our president and uh, the decision that he has to make. He said this is the most uh, challenging a uh, decision that he has had to make in his presidency, 877-757-9424. Starting to get some phone calls now. So what do you think, both on a civil uh, basis and also from a church basis? Are you at the point now? Have you changed? Uh, I mean, three weeks ago, you might have been a six, like, hey, let's, let's kind of, you know, tap the brakes here. Let's just stay in our homes and watch these live stream masses. Uh, but uh, let, let's see what some of you are saying. Let's go. Are we ready to go to Maria? Oh, dear Maria, who calls in quite often good on the program. Uh, Maria, how you doing? Good morning. Uh, good, what do you, what do you think? Good morning. Are you ready to go oh, to you, masses? You, you're giving me so much strength with your very lively morning voice. <laughs> okay. Very happy. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Well, yes, absolutely, because counting on the power and the work of the Holy Spirit who leads the church, and then we, with our prayers, we must trust in God. This evil is a demonic evil. We must not give it power and, and much, you know, uh, power in it. It is taking power, power over us. No, we have to go. Yes, we are ready. We are ready to, to receive the Lord and to continue praying to defeat this evil serpent all right so maria if masses were regular to uh this sunday you know a full capacity crowd would you go uh would you sit in that you know are, are you if there was no social distancing would you go back to, to church absolutely dave i go now i'm ready all right I'm <laughs> she's ready to go <laughs> All right. Uh, th thanks, Maria. Appreciate you calling in. I know you're from the, uh, the, the, the Dallas Diocese. We'd love to hear from all of you. We got about, uh, well, gosh, time flies. We only got about seven, eight minutes remaining in the show. We are going to have a little after show afterwards uh, for all of our social media platforms. If you want to chime in on this one, 877 757 
9424 877-757-9424. Also, don't want to dismiss the fact that uh, obviously a lot of people have been impacted by this from a health perspective. Many people, I don't know what the numbers are now across the United States, 45,000 people, 50,000 people have died uh, directly or indirectly related to the coronavirus. So not to make uh, light of that at all, but I think most of us are saying, let's Let's get back to how things were. Uh, 877-757-9424. I see we had another call. Did they get cold feet? Yeah, uh, yeah, that was actually our friend Anne-Marie in Germantown, Maryland, oh, who calls right? in very often during the uh, share with her Marian challenges, usually our first donor <laughs> yeah. of the day. So you have to really get up early if you want to be Anne-Marie. And she was just bringing up um, that uh, Our Lady of America, uh, America, one of her requests was that um, her statue be moved two blocks every so frequently. I was trying to look up the information to make sure I had it right. Um, but that was just one thing she wanted to bring up when I brought up about um, reconsecrating America, mm-hmm. that that's something else that we haven't been doing. And she was saying that we need to go back to that. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good story because those who are just tuning in right now, uh, that was one of the stories we had at the top of the hour is that uh, Archbishop Gomez from the Archdiocese of uh, Los Angeles mm-hmm. is inviting all other bishops across America and Canada, I yeah. think, to re-consecrate the United States uh, to Our Lady. Okay, yeah. and so this is what Anne Marie was talking yes, about. Yes, yes. Right? So she just wanted to, you know, reiterate the importance of doing that and, you know, keeping our promises to Our Lady. Yeah. Um, so definitely, I could talk about the cool guy saying again. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll go ahead and mention him again. Okay, yeah. sure. sure. So uh, I was uh, talked about earlier this morning that there is, if you are unemployed or struggling financially during this pandemic, because 26 million people in the United States fled uh, filed for unemployment since the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus. Um, there is a saint for that because, you know, the Catholic Church has abundance of saints that fall under many categories. And so this is St. Catagen who um, was a contemporary with Martin Luther, who also wanted to reform things in the church. But unlike Martin Luther, he actually wanted to stay within the church and um, better it. Um, But uh, he uh, was part of a a order called the Congregation of Clerics Regular, and they took their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience very seriously. And he was particularly severe on himself. He would... um, partake in devotions and prayers late at night and early in the morning with just a short rest on a bed of straw. Mm. <laughs> and he, so he was very humble. He, like I mentioned, he opened a hospital for people who were considered uh, not going to be able to recover. Um, so they would have a beautiful place for them to be. Um, and so, yeah, he's considered someone that you can ask for intercession if you're struggling financially. Yeah. Uh, all right. So St. Cajetan, please pray for also us. Cool this guy. is uh, he's a cool guy, <laughs> right? Uh, GRN Live here. Just have a few minutes remaining. If you want to join in and talk to us about any of the topics that we mentioned, uh, the phone number is 877-757-9424. I wish Anne Marie had come on because uh, we always I know. see I her name. Her. We I talk know. about her. It's uh, it's like but, a- Alan from Houston, like legendary people yes, during our share Yes, exactly. GRN legends. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's also one other thing I wanted to to mention that's unrelated, uh, kind of unrelated to all these other things. Uh, sometimes we have topics that you know almost became the topic of the show, but on Monday, uh, Joe spent the entire hour he and his crew talking about vaccines. I don't mm-hmm. know if you heard this show yeah. or not. Um, uh, Bishop Strickland from the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, has written a pastoral letter on ethical development right. of a COVID-19 vaccine. Now, I just want to read um, one paragraph of it. Uh, and let's see. He says, I ask you to, and this is you know halfway through the letter. This isn't how it begins. He says, I ask you to join your voices with mine in an effort to bring to a halt a reality of which until recently I knew very little about the use of inline stem cells from aborted babies in developing vaccines. We all know the sad saga of abortion in our nation and throughout the world, which continues to grow more diabolical, even as we energetically proclaim with an ever, ever deeper clarity, the precious gift of every unborn child. As the world battles the coronavirus and marches towards a vaccine or cure, the ugly culture of death is exposing itself in an even more serious way. The church has long defended the right to life and love owed to our children. Recent popes have unanimously pointed to the culture of death that is rampant in our, co- in our world as a threat that we must address. In his 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, in English, the letter is called The Gospel of Life, In this beautiful letter, Pope John Paul II said, modern society faces a clash between the culture of death and the culture of life. In direct language, he said that the killing of innocent human creatures, even if carried out to help others, constitutes an absolute unacceptable act. 
A better translation of Pope St. John Paul's powerful phrase in the Gospel of Life would use the phrase human persons. The child in the womb is more than a creature. The child in the womb is a human person, just as we are human persons. Okay, so he goes on and talks about the vaccine. And this is something that may become a reality because people like Bill Gates and some of the folks of that ilk are pushing for, of mm -hmm. course, we all want, I mean, I think most people would say, yeah, let's get a vaccine. Let's sure. get a vaccine. But is it going to be an ethical one? Is it going to be one that, uh, uh, that, that, that Christians and, and Catholics of, of, of uh, you know, can morally accept? And right. if not, that's going to, that's going to cause um, a, a oh, conflict. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so glad Bishop Strickland wrote that um, because it's one of those things that you think is common sense that you can't, you know, kill someone, a child to make it to yeah. help save someone that, that's just you can't that's not how that works but unfortunately today it's very uh <laughs> gets a little gray and people don't always recognize that yeah and joe's guest on monday said that of the vaccines that are being uh tested right now i think she said most of them are morally acceptable oh, there are some good. that are not but the fear i think that bishop strickland has is the one that they unveil right. the one that the works one that comes through you know? the one that works even if it saves uh, you know, lives from COVID-19, uh, are we going to be able to take that? And I think what he's advising his flock is, nope, we can't do no. it. Can't do it because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the end does not justify the means, which Absolutely. is a great principle of morality. All right, we're just about out of time. And uh, I just want to remind you that tomorrow morning at 9 Central, if you want to join us across the Guadalupe Radio Network, uh, there's going to be a men's conference, but it's open to all people, and uh, it's going to be locally on the radio in North Texas, but available to everybody across uh, the GRN and all of our social media platforms. Deacon Harold Sivers is going to be praying the rosary and also giving a reflection on the rosary and also talking about the Eucharist and uh, what it means to live uh, with a Eucharistic heart. So we invite you to join us for that. And uh, otherwise, thanks to our, I was going to say our guests, but our, our one guest uh, who came on, right? Uh, thanks yeah, to yeah, you know. Russell Shaw. Don't forget, the, uh, the, that book is called Eight Popes in the Crisis of Modernity. And also thanks to Dr. Chris Malloy and Cecil Anderson. Diane Xavier doing a splendid job with social media. And um, what else? Uh, we have our after show after we get off the air here. So in just a couple moments when we get off the air, we'll go. Uh, you can watch us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at, at GRN Online. So join us there, and if you have any comments, it would be great to continue the discussion. All right, uh, that's going to do it. Have a great, great weekend, a great beginning of the third uh, Sunday and week of Easter. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to tune in tomorrow morning uh, for the replay and also uh, Joe and the team Monday morning, 8 o'clock Central Time for GRN Live Monday. God bless you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Friday. St. Catagen, pray, pray for, for us. us. Thank you for listening to GRN Alive. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Palmer here at the Guadalupe Radio Network. Thank you for watching GRN Live, and stay tuned because in a couple of minutes, we're going to have the after show. So I hope you can join us.
All right. Thanks so much for tuning in and joining us for the after show here on GRN Alive. We had the hour on the radio, and now we spend a little bit of time, probably just 10 or 15 minutes, talking to you in a more intimate setting, uh, talking about uh, some of the topics that we talked about uh, on the program today. Uh, Dave Palmer, Cecil Anderson, Diane Xavier here with us, and uh, Cecil actually comes into this room for this part Woo! of it, so no, no, longer, lo no the longer on the other side of the glass. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. All right. Uh, kind of interesting show. We had Russell Shaw on, it and was. then all of a sudden discussion. we find out that we didn't have our, our Knights of Columbus <laughs> guest. <laughs> Uh, uh, but, you know, you got to roll with the punches, right? Life goes on. <laughs> I remember I, I used to, um, I, 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 I was asked years ago to fill in for Teresa Tamio uh, on her Catholic Connection show, which, you know, is broadcast, right. uh, you know, nationwide. And I used to just panic about that exact thing happening. You know, what happens if there's a guest is not available? And, uh, you know, and, and I must say, I, 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 conf I booked this about a week ago, and I, I thought yesterday, I said, you know, I probably should have checked to make sure that he's still available, and I didn't. I just assume he was. Uh, but, you know, you, you just roll with the punches, and you just get on, and you talk. Yeah, and you definitely, know. definitely. Oh, gosh, yeah, that would be my worst nightmare, being by myself and having to, like, s just talk. Mm -hmm. I get tired of the sound of my own voice. Yeah, well, that, that's where it's nice to have the Marias out there and yes. the Anne Marie's who yes. call in and make little comments Absolutely. and keep and the, the conversation knowledge. going. And the knowledge, Dave, you have a lot of knowledge about the faith. That's true. So that, that's, that's true. very helpful. I, I should have I should have taught about the Summa <laughs> Theologia. Boy, wouldn't that have then been suddenly nice? all the phone lines would have been like, <laughs> I have something to... No, <laughs> I, I, I could have talked about that for hours you oh, know but, sure. but we all have something i mean it's like if i were to say you, you know can you talk about film production or that's true uh you know diane about uh journalism you know we all we all have something that we're really good at that we could talk about forever right mm -hmm. absolutely that all is right so true. all right so we uh kind of exhausted the whole um topic of are you ready to get back to mass uh we we, we spoke about that for a while we talked we spoke about our saint cajetan we talked about the consecration of our country to Our Lady. And so you, you had kind of an interesting topic that you thought we could kick around right now. Yeah, definitely. I think it's super easy for us just to talk about all the things that we're missing, everything that we can't do and all the all the bad things that are going on. But also a lot of people have been, you know, rising up and doing some pretty awesome things. And so I thought we could all, I think we, I'm sure we all know about someone doing something really cool to help yeah. the community and to help others. So I thought we could all just bring up a few of those things that we've heard about. Yeah. So. I'll tell you what, let me, uh, not to put anybody in the spot, but uh, <laughs> have, you, have you done anything personally? I mean, is there anything that you're doing differently? Uh, and, I, and I'll um, kind of start with myself. And if, you know, if there's nothing that comes to mind, that's, that's <laughs> no big deal. You can talk about what other people sure. are. But I know I, I'm, I'm making a, be a, a, a better effort to just be a better neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, because more the, the neighbors are out a lot more. There's right. more people taking walks. I've had more conversations with my neighbors the last uh, few weeks than I, I think I had the, the previous several years. Uh, and that's been kind of nice. And, um, and and I did put up on next door one time that I had toilet paper if anybody <laughs> wanted it. Nobody <laughs> took me up on oh, it. So. <laughs> you should have been the most popular person in the neighborhood. I know. So anyways, what are you or what have you sure. heard of? Um, um, so like you said about the neighbors is that um, – we have some great neighbors, but, you know, again, don't always see each other, don't always stay in contact. So for Easter, my sister and I went and delivered goodies to everyone, you know, rang the doorbell and yeah. ran away. Um, and then also um, I've been trying to be a better friend and stay up to date with my friend and be more personal with my friends, especially since moving to online school is quite stressful. Mm -hmm. um, and especially as we're getting towards the end of the semester. So I wrote all my friends a handwritten note and sent email. Uh, I call it a pandemic letter. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then also uh, my parish um, for their outreach ministry uh, is trying to get people to write to all of the um, homebound or people in nursing homes who cannot have visitors at the mm. moment who are very lonely so um our homeschool group is part of that and so my siblings and i will write will write letters for that as well draw pictures and yeah such. So i'm curious if you are uh with us on social media are, are you doing anything or have you had anything where people are blessing others during this uh covid19 crisis diane did you, did you want to uh, contribute anything or what, what have yeah, you yeah i mean i donated some of the masks that i had because i had a lot of extra masks to friends and um, also, I noticed, not me personally, but um, like Catholic charities have been donating food to uh, people <laughs> <Diane's> at churches. <laughs> Diane's, Diane's multitasking Diane. over there. Diane, Diane's trying to uh, do <laughs> two things at one time. And so when you hear her voice get away from the mic, that means she's just trying to switch <laughs> the, uh, the, the camera. All right. Uh, so let's hear from you. What are you doing? What have you heard about? 
Uh, you can do it uh, through, I, I think, uh, Sissel's monitoring Twitter and YouTube, and I'm, I'm looking at our, our Facebook feed here as well. Uh, I wonder if there's uh, any, I, I've thought about this, is there going to be any part of this that when life gets back to normal, we're going to miss? Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of people are kind of digging working from home. You know, it's sometimes it's, it's stressful, and you, you got you know the kids running around the house, and I'm gonna uh, miss the light traffic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. True. There's like no traffic. So true. I find it kind of eerie. It's though. Like what happened though? I can't pay, pray my full rosary no, <laughs> in the yeah. car. You know, you yeah. know what I actually like uh, that I think I'm gonna miss is th- there's under normal circumstances. There's so much going on, and there's so much, so many things to do, and so many events. And I love these oh, conferences yeah, yeah, and meetings and Bible studies, and uh, you know. And, there, and I was always conflicted because I was always being pulled away uh, from mm. from the family to do this and that. Right. And there's none of that right now. You know, there's yeah. not a lot of not a lot of things you have to RSVP that you can't go to sure. because there's no events. Yeah, and I agree with that. That's what I was gonna say is that um, I'm really enjoying. Listen, I, I'm a quite an introverted person, so staying home in general is nice for me. I like you like you said, I love going to church events. I love doing lots of things, but it's been great to have nothing on your schedule mm-hmm. um, uh, to do. So that's it, yeah, because I it, think it's really easy for all of us to just kind of go at a super fast speed through life yeah. and go from one thing to the next to the next and not really take anything in. So, yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, and we had somebody, we have a, a show here locally called Connected During Crisis, and we had a lady on uh, Wednesday talking about, she started, you know, making masks. You know, Diane was talking about uh, contributing some of her masks. And, uh, you know, what what else is, uh, uh, have you, uh, you know, God bless the, the healthcare workers. I mean, they really have to put themselves on the line. There's some of these people have to isolate themselves from their families because of the job they have. I know that, that, that has been very sad is that because they're in contact with people with COVID on a regular basis, these healthcare workers oftentimes are not able to go back to their families. And so they have to uh, yeah. sacrifice considerably. So we're very grateful for that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it's a strange new world that we live in. I remember also another one of our local shows, um, a couple of uh, middle school, early high school boys created a website app sort of system where um, people basically they were asking for volunteers who if they wanted to do something to help people in the community they would find the you know kind of someone needed something and someone wanted to help they'd like hook oh, get those people to connect yeah. those people so that they could if someone needed uh elderly person needed groceries and someone some person who was not yeah. as you know in a less healthy situation where they could possibly get the uh, coronavirus would go and get him for them and it was yeah. really cool it was cool that these boys uh, when they have this time on their hands they what they managed to come yeah. up yeah yeah because i've often thought like you know i want to do more i want to help the homeless right. i want to help the elderly so you're saying if somebody says i want to help the elderly i want to help the pre you know the unborn i and then this person will say, okay, this group needs you, this group needs you, and make it easy on you, on yourself so you don't have to go and reinvent right, the right. wheel and yeah, exactly. do all the research. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, definitely. It's hard to know but in times like this, where do you start? What is the thing to do? And I'd say just start with the people around you, like your neighbors, like Dave yeah. mentioned. Also, um, it's been brought up several times with food banks are running low because again when people went crazy at the stores mm-hmm. at the beginning of this and honestly still continuing yeah um stuff yeah i sometimes lower. wonder and uh yeah, yeah th- some the people that go across the world on these mission trips or you right. know not, they're not doing it now but that they, they do it and like they, do you know your next door neighbor i mean right uh, it, it's and not to knock the mission trips they're no, great no, but sometimes absolutely. we want to go far off lands and help people, and which is, God bless you, it's a great thing to do, but your, your neighbor next door might be hurting. Sure, absolutely. That's such a, yeah, such an important thing. Um, I remember one year, our parish, our youth group, they do yearly mission trips. Um, they stay within the states. They just go to um, sometimes Texas, New Mexico. They go around. Um, but one year, we stayed home and just did work for our parishioners. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really great, beautiful lesson for all the teens is because, again, the, the going across the country is very, attra- uh, you know, across the world is very attractive. It's, you know, like, oh, look what I did. I went across the world and I helped all these people. Um, but the low, you know, our kind of saying for this particular mission trip was uh, service starts at home. Yeah. So, hey, somebody uh, made a comment on Hi. Facebook. Uh, Jamie said she's participating in the Uplift Your Priest Ooh. campaign, supporting your local priest uh, with acts of kindness. Uh, it's a hashtag Uplift Your Priest. Oh, cool. uplift, I just found an article on yeah, it. Yeah, Uplift Your Priest. And so, Jamie, thank you so much uh, for letting us know about that. Uh, and uplift that's your another priest. thing to support your parishes during this time. All oh, right. I know donations are not coming in as normal, so you can go online. And tithe. Yeah. I, 
I mentioned the conversation I had with a priest who called me and asked about, you know, what are people saying about getting back into a normal life? And I, uh, I yesterday c- called uh, one, well, a, a local priest uh, um, who recently had some health issues, uh, uh, Father Cargo, uh, Father Cargo. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, because normally you, you only call priests when you want something. Hey, I right. want confession. Right. I want, and I, and I said, you know, I'm just going to call him and see how he's doing. And how, cause, because he had the uh, heart, the heart. Uh, issue, yeah. and then all the the coronavirus craziness struck, and you think like, wow, um, I wonder how he's doing. And right. so I, I called, and there wasn't an. Oh, and by the way, I also wanted to see if we could do this. I just wanted to call him and see how he's doing, and uh, and hopefully I'll I'll get a call back. I had to leave a message with him, but it might be a nice idea. Just call your priest and see how they're doing. Uh, I know Father Jason has a personal care website where he posts his updates. Mm. You know, oh, does he? Okay, doing on every oh, two good. days. Okay. All right, maybe I should just check that website. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> call us more quit, personal. Quit, quit calling me, and I, I, I got a call from a buddy of mine from Par- the parish, and uh, and and he just said, "Dave, I, I just miss talking to you after mass, and uh, you know, it's just not the same." And I just wanted to see how you're doing, and mm-hmm. I, I really appreciated that so much. So yeah. I think we ought to do that. Just call people. That, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's something we should be doing in life in general. Yeah. But this is again, this is like one of those good things that's coming out of this is that we're realizing that that hey, we should. I should. If you think, I always think that if you someone comes to your mind that hasn't come up in your mind very often or something, or I think that's a little thing from the Holy Spirit yeah. telling you to pray for that person or to reach out to them and see how they're doing. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, people say, call your mother. And I think, you know, if, as, since both of you have lost your mothers and you're mm-hmm. a lot younger than I am, uh, and, and my, I, I think you would echo that. Uh, oh, yeah. Of course, you can you can call your mother, so <laughs> to speak, uh, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a supernatural way. But uh, you're, you, if your mother is alive and you're able to pick up the phone and call her, I know my mom appreciates it very much. Uh, just call her and say, hey, how you doing? You can call your dad. As well, I mean, he, <laughs> but but I think moms in particular appreciate yeah. being in touch with uh, with their. I, I, yeah. Every week, every Thursday night, we're having a Zoom call. All my my three That's sisters awesome. and my mom and I, and it's it's great. Do you guys do anything like that? Uh, I mean, with uh, you're you're living at home, so you probably yeah, don't have yeah. to have a Zoom I, call. So are you, Diane? Uh, I do that with my friends, and my dad does it with his cousins. I do. Um, my friends and I have a prayer group that we need to be more consistent on, <laughs> but uh, we where we get together in video chat and we just kind of talk about our weeks and mm-hmm. pray for each other. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the men's conference is tomorrow morning, uh, mm-hmm. nine o'clock. You guys are going to be here. I was going to say, well, are you going to watch it? But you're going <laughs> to, yeah, you're going to be forced into it. I don't know. It. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ha- have you uh, participated in any virtual conferences or did you, the CPLC one last Saturday? Mm-hmm. I, I I watched that and uh, I, I don't know. I watched that one. I know, I know some people are saying like they had this big uh, Catholic conference a couple weeks ago, yeah. but most I, of the talks were pre-recorded. Right. And that's so what not, they're not normally live. Sure. Yeah. I did participate in that one a little. I watched a couple of videos from people I really l- enjoyed hearing speaking anytime. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I need to be better about it. There's so many great resources at this time. And it's really easy right now, I feel like, when you're at home and working from home sometimes to not do as much as you should <laughs> can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, that's going to just about wrap things up. Anything else, Diane, on your mind or any messages for our, our dear viewers, I guess, not listeners, uh, viewers that you want to say before we say goodbye? Well, if you don't have anything to do tomorrow morning, of course, listen to your local station. But if you're um, on the web, uh, go to our uh, GRN Facebook page and you'll see the North Texas Men's Conference. Deacon Harold Burke Servers will be leading an adoration and rosary. Yeah, it's gonna yeah, be he, awesome. He's gonna have the Blessed Sacrament behind him. You saw that, that's and so then leading cool. the Rosary, a reflection on the Rosary, and also on the Eucharist as well. So that's gonna be that's gonna be cool. Yeah, and it's called the Men's Conference. Well, like we said, since it's virtual, it, it's really open to everyone, and everyone yeah. can learn something. Because Deacon Harold is amazing. So mm-hmm. whatever he says will, you know, touch you in some way. Yeah, I hope so. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Cecil. Thank you, Diane. Uh, thanks, to everybody who's watching uh, out there in social media land. And uh, don't forget, uh, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, the, the men's conference starts. Also, 10 o'clock, everywhere except for North Texas. You can watch the replay of uh, one of the GRN Alive programs, either Monday or Friday. And then uh, Monday, tune in for Joe and the team, 8 o'clock Central Time for GRN Alive Monday edition. So, anyways, have a great, great weekend. God bless you, and thanks for watching. Let me see if I have heard back from uh, uh, let's see did she she didn't write me uh, um
Oh, okay. She said, so sorry to do this to you in the last minute, but Andrew Walther just told me something came up and he is unable to do the radio interview in, thir in 30 minutes. Um, yeah, so she, she wrote this at 8.12 this morning. I mean, we're already into the show.